Welcome, Alice. Thank you. I've, I've seen a lot of you today, and you've done a wonderful <laughs> job. Please give her a warm hand. She, Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. She is the master of ceremony and the master connector. And also, I want to welcome Andrea Citigraf. She is an extraordinary entrepreneur and started a company called Blitzmasters. And uh, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but she also sings. Oh. Um. <laughs> That's, that's an amazing talent. She was actually about six years ago in Las Vegas, and we were at the Four Seasons, and I asked her to be on stage and sing a song, and she did, and she blew <laughs> <again>. everybody away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask you today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and we have uh, Bill Wallace. Tell us about yourself. I'm a um, vice president with Revenue Storm Consulting Company, and I... Uh, I'm a corporate refugee from a company called MCI after 16 years, and I realized after being a really, really bad corporate guy that I was really more of an entrepreneur, so I started a couple software companies, and I, I stopped doing that in 2007 and, and joined this company, and I've been working with clients around the world, so it's been a great adventure. Okay, uh, everybody's going to get 10 seconds. How do you define sales enablement? How do I define sales enablement? Well, for me, and we've talked about this before, it's just everything that enables our sales teams to do a better job than they're doing today. So it can be technology, it can be training, it can be coaching, but it's all the things that really get our sales team to peak performance. Thank you, Andrea. I would say um, empowering them with the skills, tools, and knowledge they need to continue uh, behavior moving forward. So maybe you, you give them a skill, you teach them, you, know, you give them that knowledge, maybe you only do it one time, but if you teach them sort of how to fish on their own, then they can continue uh, the behavior moving forward once they've proven the results to themselves. Thank you, Bill. I'd say equipping, but it's equipping specific people with specific things at specific times. Hmm. All right, now I'd like to ask the audience with a show of hands. In your company, when it comes to sales enablement, is that reporting to sales? Raise your hand. Okay. How many? About 10? Yeah, a little more than that. Maybe about And <laughs> marketing. Yeah. Very few. Couple. Very yeah. few. OK. Um, you have worked with a lot of companies. Uh, what is your experience? Uh, should sales enablement report to marketing, or sales, or both? Or? I think the more that sales enablement is aligned and working in conjunction with sales leadership, the better it's going to be. I also believe that there needs to be a tight line between sales and marketing. But I think the more that it's geared to the actual sales functional channel, I think it's going to be more successful. Now, Alice, when it comes to sales enablement, what comes to my mind first is content. And you talked about all the content that salespeople need in order to be more effective. And uh, I had a slide in my uh, keynote presentation today where there's an Aberdeen, no, a Forrester study, where they said that only 13% of salespeople judged by bias are capable of being competent in the buyer's eyes. So it seems that 77% <laughs> of salespeople out there cannot yeah. help the buyer so that the buyer says, <clears throat> this is a competent sales rep. So how do you design content that makes salespeople look smart and feel good? Yeah. Well, it's the big question, right? And again, if sales and marketing don't work together, you can't do it. But you do have to look around and, and find some tools that help them. So we can give salespeople training, and we do the best job we can, but we also have to give them something to rely on in the field. So they've got it in their hot little hands. So many people have tablets today. Many salespeople have tablets. It's awesome. You can use tools like App Data Room. You can use some of the other tools um, that we've seen out here today. And equip them so you know at least they've got in front of them the things that are going to make them look smart and be able to talk smart and help the customer understand. What does App Data Room do? What App Data Room does is they take all of the collateral and all of the information that a sales team needs and puts it on a tablet so that the most current information is available at all times. You know the old story of, oh, it's that version, it's this version. Where'd you get that? That's three years old. 
You know, when you have salespeople out there with dispersed information and, and it's the wrong information or it hasn't, you know, hasn't been approved. I, I love salespeople who go out and make their own PowerPoints and decide they're gonna use them. So in this way, marketing can work with sales to decide what information needs to be in front of the salesperson and get it all in one place and be in control of making sure the most current version is available on the tablet for the salesperson. Got it. Yeah. So Andrea, you address more at the top of the funnel and uh, we talk about sales and marketing alignment. What are the disconnects that you see in companies when it comes to the top of the funnel? Well, a lot of what I see, uh, and this is actually a part of, you know, aside from what I do as a, a prospecting um, expert, um, is often the salespeople aren't incented at the right part of the sales process. You'll see them being paid maybe at the end once the company collects funds from the client. Well, now you have a really expensive collections agent instead of a salesperson. You really want to be, you know, motivating and incenting that salesperson to make the sale and then pay them and then you transition that customer to a project manager and then if you have need collections and you hire people to do that. But that was one of the biggest disconnects that I've, that I've seen just in some of the clients that I work with is paying people at the wrong point in the process. So you know, when you pay them, you're motivating behavior. And so if you pay me when I make the sale, that frees me up to go and make the next sale, which is what you want a salesperson to do. If you pay me at the end of the process, once you as a company have collected the money, well now you can bet I'm gonna be on that phone trying to collect the money from the client and that's not the best use of my time. You see the disconnect in a different area, the way I look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the that's, big That's my poker face. Let, yeah. let's, <laughs> let's talk about the elephant in the room. Where's the big disconnect? With sales and marketing? No, with sales enablement. So I want to go, um, I think I might answer that question with the question you asked originally, go right? Ahead. And, and so I have a little bit of a different spin, but I don't think anybody in the panel would disagree with that. And that is, and this might sting a little bit, and I apologize, mm -hmm. but it needs to be said. I think we send too many people out with our point of view about their business. And, and let me say a little bit more about that. I think that we have a lot of people sharing information but not sharing insight. I think we have a lot of people visiting with prospects who don't know much about their business or much about their role. And I think this is much more of an insight business. I think business acumen is going to be a really prized competency in the next couple of years, and I think it's gonna be a big bifurcation in, in sales. I think it's gonna be absolutely critical. And, and I wanna add one other thing. Marketing with all good intentions equips or arms the sales force sometimes with the wrong stuff. And I'll give you an example. Um, and, I, and I've talked to clients around the world about this. Without even seeing a lot of the presentations, I can almost guarantee you that the average presentation that a lot of people take out to see a sales or a prospect with, probably 20 pages. 20 pages. And the first six slides are all about you. And I think that's absolutely ridiculous. And the attention span of an executive today, if that's your target, it's probably literally maybe five minutes, and I'm being generous about that. Mm -hmm. You have to make an impression, you have to bring some thought leadership, create some insight, or you're gone. Yep. And I think if you're gonna spend the time, the precious time you right. have, talking about yourself, you're, you're, you're already, you've done them a disservice. And by the way, you get one shot. One shot, and you won't get a second one. So I wanted to just throw that out there. I think you guys would agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, there, there are actually, uh, in my mind, two kinds of bias. Um, you know, if you believe all the statistics, 80% um, of the sales process happens online and yeah. not while the salesperson is there. So that's one kind of bias, which is the educated bias. Mm -hmm. But on the other end of the spectrum, there is the person who always is curious on how to improve business. So when the salesperson connects with that person, it's a different situation because the buyer is not even educated in what they're looking for. So we are moving from, and your company is sort of the leader, from demand ca capture to demand creation. I absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. So the, the question <laughs> is, how do you create uh, sales enablement 
and execute so that you satisfy both fields. The salesperson who is in front of a customer that's educated, and what are the 20% the 20 of the, the gap that you have? The buyer has 80%. What is, are the 20%? What does that represent? What does that mean to the salesperson? What do they need to deliver in that case? And how can they shift from completing the buyer's information uh, when they make the next call on a buyer who does not even know how to shop? Is that to me? <laughs> That's to you. Right. <laughs> oh, you get all the okay. softball no, 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 questions. No, no. It's, it's a great question, right? I think it's a great question. And I think I would, I would liken it almost to languages, right? So one person may be speaking a language in the area of a transaction, right? And, and so they might be more of a transactional buyer. And the issue there is, in my opinion, rather than spout text specs and pricing, right, fairly transactional, is to take them to a place where I can now educate them on the application of whatever it is I'm selling on how it can affect their internal metrics or their external metrics with their, with their clients, their revenue, their margin. It's a matter of translation to them. I, I see a lot of that, so you have to speak that language. The second language is what, what really true thought leadership is all about. I'm not even aware that I have a problem. I'm not even aware I have an opportunity. And that's where true thought leadership comes into play. How do I equip that to happen? We see it all the time. And that's where marketing does a lot of in-depth research on either the industry or that particular company, that particular title, CFOs versus sales VPs, whatever, and literally brings something that's timely, relevant, in the news, it's something, I'll, I'll, let's call it an accelerating trend, and let's take that and bring it down to the application of a service or a product. But it's designed to take them out of their world and to get them thinking differently about what's going on around them, right? If you can do that and you can make a connection between, you know, here's what's going on and here's where I can help you either exploit that opportunity or I can help you from from incurring that liability, I think that's the way I deal with the second piece. I don't know if that makes is that clear? Well, I, I think that uh, there are another two ways to look at it. One is you can program people to serve, say certain things and share certain things with certain customers. And there's the buying persona and there are the different levels of, uh, right. of maturation in terms of understanding. You know, so you, you have sort of a ma matrix that you can follow. But I think that a lot of salespeople lack the internal flexibility to push all this aside and just listen to the customer. So I think sales, sales enablement is related to self-enablement. So if I okay. enable myself and say, I suspend all preoccupation with my sale right now, and I just want to listen to Andrea, what are her major concerns? Right. Uh, who is she as a person? And uh, what, what dreams and hopes does she have? And how can I ask the right questions to find out whether there's a fit or not? So Andrea, I'm, I'm, I wanna hear from you. You're helping a lot of salespeople sort of go through the barrier of uh, you know, getting inside the company, getting an appointment. Mm -hmm. what, what is your methodology? for finding out whether there's a good fit. And, and I want you to describe maybe two, two key ideas. Uh, are you talking specifically about gatekeepers and that, right, that right. issue of? How do I get through the gatekeeper? Then secondly, how do I know that there's a fit where it's worth my time uh, so I can invest in that relationship? Yeah, you've got to ask a lot of, a lot of great questions. Well, on the gatekeeper piece, I, I'm a very tactical and practical kind of person. You know, I know a lot of what we've talked about is strategy, you know, right, which is way up here. And what Blitzmasters does is very tactical and practical. So I'll just share a couple of tips around the whole gatekeeper piece. So one of the things we talk about is um, the thing that with gatekeepers that can be a little dangerous when you're dealing with them is that they can tell you no, but they can't tell you yes. So you want to sort of get past them. And the way that you can do that is that when the gatekeeper answers the phone, you ask for the sales department, or you ask for HR, or you ask for the help desk. The gatekeeper's been told on the first day of, of being you know, employed at that company, whatever you do, don't let a salesperson in here. That's their <laughs> job, is to not let you in. 
but the people at HR or you know the help desk or the sales department never got that message. They're more likely to help. So if you go immediately to that other department and then ask for who you'd like to speak with, you're more likely to get the call transferred. Also, for the person receiving that decision maker now receiving that call, it's coming from an inside line and not necessarily the front desk. So they're more likely to, to pick it up. Um, also, calling before 8 a.m. and after 5 p.m. is a good time to reach decision makers because the gatekeepers have gone home. The decision makers are, are typically there. And so you can often have a more sort of relaxed conversation at that time, too, because they're, it's before the day has started or now the day's ended. Uh, maybe they have a little more time to you know, have that conversation. So let's say you get through the decision maker, you have that conversation. How do you lead a conversation when you don't know how much time you got and you don't know what's, what their mindset is in the moment? And how do you go to that uh, crucial conversation to find out whether there's a fit? Well, I'm, I'm all about face-to-face -face meetings. If at all possible, I really like to get in front of people. So I make that first call very much about getting the appointment, whether it be, I mean, in some cases, uh, for some folks, it might be the, a conference call, or it may be a face-to-face, -face, but I think it's a little, um, what's the word? You're assuming an awful lot to say, I'm gonna call this person and take 15 or 20 minutes of their time right now. So in some ways, I almost think it's more polite to just simply ask for the appointment to have a conversation at a later date, either a face-to-face -face or a conference call. And I think people like that, that you respect their time and that you're asking for, I understand you're busy and I'm asking for 15, 20, 30 minutes, however much, at a later date when we can have a, a more in-depth conversation. Of course, the idea is that you've done a little bit of homework ahead of time, so you already know to some degree that this person is a prospect exactly. before you even make that call, right? And you probably used the internet to help you. Right. You've probably been on LinkedIn, right. LinkedIn, right. Twitter, right. and you, you, know, you actually know something right. about them. Right, and try to find some common ground. That's, that's great if you've got a common connection in LinkedIn, for right. example. So Alice, is social selling part of sales enablement? Well, in my opinion, absolutely yes. But you know, I always say this, show up online as you show up in person. Mm -hmm. It's not two different things, it's not two different places, it's not, oh, some place I'll show up if I have a little time. As a salesperson, as a business owner, you need to show up, be present, be authentic, show people that you care and get to know them because that's what's going to what make the difference. It's going to the, allow them to refer you. It's going to allow them to connect you with other people that they know. It's going to make them want to buy from you when they need what you have, even though they may not re need it right now, or tell others to do the same, or maybe they'll collaborate with you in some way. But if people keep thinking of online as something else, something over there, something I don't need to do because, oh, you know. Well, your audience is there. There's over 300 million people on LinkedIn. Your audience is there. And you need to talk to your audience wherever they want to talk to you. So you've got to ask them, where are they? Where are they showing up? Where do they want to talk to you? And talk to them that way. And you've got to be real, be authentic, right? And care about other people. I mean, that's really what it is about in the world today. The transactional sale, yeah, there's still some space for that. But it's really about a relationship because it should be so much more than I met you and I'm gonna sell something to you. It should be I met you and we're gonna see what we can do together. How can we collaborate? And maybe we will do business together, but maybe you end up being my best referral source or I'll hire you or who knows. Mm -hmm. Keep your mind open to all the possibilities and then the things just start to happen. So show up online the same way you show up here. So uh, number one rule is you need to be found. Let's ask the audience uh, show of hands, how many of you in the last 30 days have typed in your name at Google and see what comes up? Yeah. My... Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. The rest that's... of you, do that. Do that. It's your <laughs> Google yourself. Google Doesn't that sound yourself. like that? Right. Some of you be very careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, I, th I think that... Uh, you know, we, we talked about buying persona this morning. Uh, I think we need to talk about the social persona that we offer up on the internet. So what does our LinkedIn profile look like? Uh, what do we tweet? Uh, what does our Facebook page look like? Because buyers will, um, you know, check you out. I'll give you one example. We just hired uh, somebody in our creative department and uh, we looked at the resumes and I was looking at the top three choices. 
I did just glance at the resume, but then I typed in Alice Hyman, let's say, and checked out the first candidate. And I wanted to know, what does Alice tweet about? I wanted to know the character of the person. I wanted to know the interest. I wanted to know who is she as a person? Uh, because the resume is something old school. Nobody pays attention to resumes anymore. You want to know who that person is. So self, sales enablement is about self-enablement. Let's talk about the leadership role. What should sales managers do? And you work with a lot of smaller companies. How should sales leaders or CEOs think about sales enablement and make it happen so that salespeople are not only equipped to, to um, give the prospect all the answers they need, but also to cut down the amount of work that they're doing right. in educating the customer. Right. Well, I think it's, it starts with the customer. Let's just talk to our customers and see what they say. Mm -hmm. If the sales leaders were closer to the customers and talking to them on a regular basis, you know, talk to your customers, talk to your prospects, talk to the people who don't end up buying yeah. from you. What do they have to say about you? What, what do they want to know? What other things do you, do you need from the customer? Then you can make the salesperson's job easier. And as, as a small business owner with many of, that I work with, they are the salesperson or at least one of the salespeople and they're managing their sales team as well. Mm -hmm. So really, if you start with the customer and pull it back in and then work with the sales and marketing team, which sometimes is, is you, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then take that information and decide how to use it to get what you need without having to, you know, show up and pitch and tell the whole, you know, take the first six minutes to tell the whole story instead. It, it really helps when you know your customer. And again, you know, before you go out, that's what our salespeople have to learn how to do. Get the information they need, gather it first before they go out so they can talk about that person and not about themselves, about the, their problems, their goals, how they win. And when they do that, it makes it all a lot easier. But just start with your customers. They can tell you the answers you need. Andrea, um, you and I have talked a uh, long time ago about the magic of a story. And a story is sort of a, uh, an, an interesting psychological construct because uh, we all grew up uh, with probably with parents that read us stories. Yeah. So there is sort of a transportation, a mental transportation that brings them back to childhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you tell stories really well about your business when you talk to your customers. Mm -hmm. How do you craft a story that is really engaging when you talk about yourself without bragging? Oh, that's a tough call. Um, <laughs> without the, without the bragging part is the, <laughs> right. is the tough thing, right? Tough right. Well, I think it's great if you, and it's to Bill's point earlier about starting at the top with the best, you know, the best thing. One of the things to think about, and I, and I was guilty of what you talked about before with the long deck and saving the best for last. <laughs> well, what if you've got a high level executive and he's got five minutes, he or she's got five minutes? Well, you want your best stuff at the front. So I completely changed my deck. I deleted a lot of slides and when I, with stories. So I start with the results we've created for other companies. Mm. Tell that story. And they're real stories, they're not fairy tales, you know, these are real stories, real results by outlining here's the challenge they had, here's the solution we provided, this is the result we created, and this is what they had to say about that result. So you start by telling the story of a success that you've created for another customer. Yeah. Now you've got their attention, they want to learn more. Oh, well, it makes sense. If you've created success like that for that customer, chances are you can do it for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's especially true if you're working with vertical markets or within the same industry. So um, we've done a lot with HP, for example, and, and let's say I want to do some work with Dell. So in, in calling Dell, they might be interested to know a little bit about the work we've done with HP just because that's a competitor and it sort of stands to reason that if we'd created success for HP and, and your market, we know your market, we know your industry, then it stands to reason that we're also going to be able to create results for you. So finding the common ground of that story you're telling about a current customer and the results you've created and that prospect. So if it's a big customer, share a story of a, of a big, if it's a big prospect, share a story of a big customer. If it's um, a small prospect, share the story of a small customer and so on. Uh, tell that story so that they are, they are able to make that, that connection. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, Bill, let's, let's talk about training. How can we enable salespeople in a way that they have the equipment, the reflexes, the, um, the savvy, uh, the skills to deal with a different spectrum of customers? Customers change constantly. And uh, you not only have different industry segments, but also you have the millennials, you have the older generation. And how do you teach salespeople to achieve that bandwidth that they're comfortable talking with anybody? Wow, man, that's a really tough question. That's kind of like teaching somebody to make friends, right? I mean, it's a little <laughs> bit tough. Um, right. Okay, so I'm going to give an idea out, and then I want to give you my opinion about how I think training could be more effective, and I've spent some time in that rank, in those ranks as well. So I was actually listening to the, to the commentary from you guys, and it just struck me. I went, wow, why wouldn't you take a new salesperson, and before you do anything, right? I mean, you can expose them to the culture and those types of things and whatever. Why wouldn't you have that person have a list of maybe 10 current customers, people that have bought from you and said, you know what, here's what I want you to yeah, do. Here are five questions. And I want you to go in, and you're not selling anything. In fact, it's going to be a dual ed, it's going to be a dual benefit, right? I want you to interview yeah, these these idea. customers. Yeah. Why did you buy from us? What did you like best? Where have we? Where would you like to see us improve, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'm just thinking to myself. First of all, the company would get remarkable benefit back from that because it's yeah. it's great testimonial. And the other thing is the person has, to your story point, mm -hmm. instant. Credibility in, yeah. in stories, right? I talked to this person, I talked to that person, I talked, and, and I don't think that you could do better training that. Here's where I think training falls short. This is, you know, again, a fairly pointed opinion, right? But that's what you paid for. Uh, and that is that I think training tries to do too much. I think it tries to do too much. I think we try to jam things at people and we do it in a short, I got a week with this person, and I'm gonna give you everything that you could possibly not need, right? Because at, at the end of the day, there's only certain things that this person needs to know. The rest of it is nice to have. The other thing is, I think onboarding starts before they join the company. Why couldn't they watch videos? Mm. Why, couldn't they, why couldn't they gain access to some of the technology? Why can't they do some of that stuff you know, in their own hours and whatever they need to do prior to coming on board so they're ready to roll? But rather than going through five days of eight o'clock in the morning until five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening where I'm just having you drink through a fire hose, I think that's ridiculous. Because I know me, personally, I won't remember half of that stuff. Right. But if I can remember these pieces, I'm gonna be effective. The other thing is, I really, I get really upset about this. Leaders in sales, right, and I'm gonna, if anybody's in here, just hear me out. Mm -hmm. Leaders in sales tend to outsource the training of their people. And I think that's wrong. I think that's absolutely wrong. As a leader, you're responsible for the development and the success of these people. They came to you and they said, hey man, I I'm gonna give you my life, my income, etc. cetera. I, I want you to prepare me. And I think a leader will always be on top of their training, always debriefing, always working with them, always filling in the gaps, etc." cetera. So obviously I must have said something that No, no, we're all just still like we should have. So more. so I think that there 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 sometimes is a disconnect between leadership and the training activity. I'll outsource them to sales enablement, let them do what they need to do, and then when I get them, I'll work with them. I, I just think that's a travesty. I don't know. That was a long rant. I hope that answered no, you your know, question. You know, one of the things you said that really struck me, I, I love the idea of just sending them out, you know, get your customers set up, say, hey, do you mind? I'm going to send some salespeople out to interview you, their training. <laughs> It'd be great if your customers will help you do that. I think a lot of them really will. But, you know, earlier we listened to um, Leon. Leon, are you still here? He was talking about the power of the story, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, <clears throat> you were just talking about the power of the story. We love stories. Now these salespeople are equipped yep. with stories to tell. Yeah. What about even so? They're they're new and they're out there fumbling with these customers, <laughs> but they've got good stories at least, and I think a story can save you. Yep. So if they're go out there just you know with good intentions to ask good questions and tell some stories, I think that will take them a lot farther than here's your pitch, go out and pitch it. Right. You know what else happens when you have those interviews um, with customers? In addition to getting testimonials that you can then share with your prospects. Something that happened with me, because I've actually done that, is we ended up creating virtual blitz programs because customers said, 
we're, we're not interested in on-site. You know, the, the trend is that people are doing this online you know, training, virtual training, and now we even have an on-demand training. And I wouldn't have, ooh, I wouldn't have thought of, I wouldn't have thought of that, you know, had my customer not said, you know, we really love the content, can you deliver it in a virtual format? I was like, what does that look like? I would have never considered that. And so uh, I took that idea and we continued to interview more customers and got enough people that said, yeah, if you build it, we will buy. Um, so we put that program yeah, together. Yeah. And what's interesting is <clears throat> several years ago, 70% of my business was our on-site program and 30% was virtual. That has switched. It's wow. now 70% virtual, 30% on-site. So, you know, what does that tell me? I just say, thank, thank God that I, you know, we thought to do this virtual thing, because the on-site <clears throat> is eventually probably gonna be obsolete. But it makes so much sense, because salespeople need <clears throat> ongoing training. Right. They don't need one training, mm -hmm. and so if they, you have it virtually, they can repeat it and repeat yep. it and repeat it and repeat it. And instead of then letting them flail miserably, they can go get the information themselves because it's right there. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've got that piece that Andrea taught me about how to get past the gatekeeper. Let me watch that again. Right. Yeah. I definitely share that trend. I see that same trend of asynchronous learning. And the future, my future vision is really when you are in the lobby and uh, you need to renegotiate a contract with a, with a customer and just go on your iPad and uh, tap into negotiation and get a, um, you know, just a two minute clip, a mm. reminder, mm. here are the five questions you wanna ask and take it into the customer. Because a, the, the thing that we are forgetting about learning is that we are forgetting. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, um, and it always strikes me too, in sports and in many other things, we practice, practice, practice. And even you know, a batter with a really high RBI will still get up the next day and practice. And right. yet, we don't expect the same from our salespeople. We have to get them to Yeah, practice. but the, the analogy is not complete because uh, in sports, they play the same game with the same rules it's over not. and over. Mm. Uh, and in sales, it's not. It's not. the customers <laughs> don't have the playbook that we are working with, yeah. right? <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> but that, all the more reason we have to practice even right. more. Right. Because we have to practice our agility. We have to practice bringing insights to right. people. We right. have to practice you know, using all the sales enablement right. that's out there in the exhibit right. hall. So many great tools that we can use and help our salespeople practice. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, some, in, we're in Las Vegas and uh, we're in the entertainment industry. And in Chicago, you have Second City. And the Second City is actually training uh, people from corporations on how to use improvisational theater techniques to do better in sales. And it's just one thing. You know, let's, let's say I make up something and I pretend I'm a, I'm a rabbi and uh, I am uh, you know, forgot my circumcision kit. Uh, <laughs> Alice, how do you deal with that? You know, you... Oh, well, hang on. Yeah. I, I, th I thought he was going to ask you for a circumcision kit. Yeah. I, yeah. Right. I have one in the first. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So you want to deal with the unexpected. I just made that up, <laughs> but the transition thing is always the word and. You never say but, but you never yeah. say however. You just deal with what comes and you stay in the moment and acknowledge the customer, deal with the customer, however crazy they may be at that moment or seem or appear, but harmonize with them and co-create something that's constructive. So we need to lead, we need to create a path through sales and enablement to lead a customer from chaos to clarity. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. And okay. especially in the case where you're saying, some of the buyers have already done the decision making, they just wanna to talk to you and make their final decision between two or three vendors or whatever it is. But for those who haven't even thought of it yet, right. that's where we have to take them from that chaos to clarity. Wow, I, I hear you're having these kinds of things going right. on. Tell me more about right. that. What is it? Hmm, that's interesting. You know, I heard about this the other day. I think salespeople need to read right. more and yeah. be very agree, up right. on what's I going agree. on with current trends. Right. Because if I hear a problem that you have as a salesperson and I can't solve it, right. I should probably See, know somebody who can. Mm -hmm. I think the distinction is between grasping for a formula to learn to becoming more <laughs> fluid because life is faster because it's more liquid. It's more, um, the internet is a 
you know, I do, I, there are no words for describing the avalanche of information that's available and actually the things that we don't know is bigger than anything that we can possibly know in a lifetime. Right, right. So what do we need to do to combat that is be cu curious. And to me, curiosity is self-enablement again. Mm -hmm, yeah. Because if I'm really curious, I ask the right questions and get the customer to a point of insight. So um, two quick questions from the audience and then we need to cut it off. Any questions? Questions? Do we have? They saw the, the bars yes. being set up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The mic is right there. Let's see. Oh, yeah. I will. Be down. She's multitasking. <laughs> I have to do two jobs. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I had a question actually for you, Andrea, because I liked how you were talking about how you wanted to, you know, tell them your success story first in the presentation. Um, what if it's like a new product that you haven't really sold before, but you've done similar products? How would you go about talking about success first in an instance like that? You could probably still tell the story about and just phrase it sort of like you just did, that we've done something similar. Um, and here's, here's the success we had with that path. You know, you, and then you, know, you still have to make that, that translation or that transition to, again, we've tried it in this environment. It works, so it only stands to reason that it's going to work here. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, just, I definitely think that sh sharing a result. You know, it used to be in sales that it was all about benefits. They'd say, don't talk about features, talk about benefits. That's not even enough anymore. It's, right. it's about results. Yeah. What's the bottom line? How are you going to impact my bottom line? And you've got seconds to be able to, yeah. to do that. So maybe start with you know, a sentence or two about how this new product is going to impact their bottom line so that they're thinking, oh, tell me more. How are you going to do that? And then it opens it up to be able to tell the story. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you. Sure. One more quick question. Oh, John. Uh, this has been a great session. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we struggle with with sales enablement is there's great tools. Everybody says the, the buyers changed. Companies has to, have to begin to engage with them. Culture's the biggest thing, right? Mm -hmm. Is basically empowering people to actually do the things they need to do when management isn't doing them, when people don't really <laughs> believe. Right. And so ultimately, I think there's a lot of great tools out here, but if we don't get management to buy in and begin right. to actually listen and engage with the customer, how can they expect the team members to do that effectively? And so ultimately, I think one of the big things to talk about is culture, because ultimately, it's, that's gonna be the hardest thing to change, because tools can be put in anywhere. What do you guys think? Yeah, uh, I've, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You, you, well, I was just gonna say, and this, this relates a little bit to what you were saying, it's John, right? right. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Go ahead. I'll think of it. Well, um, oh, I know uh, what it was. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I know what it was. <laughs> so speaking of culture, so what, I, what I've heard, and you, you can agree with me or not, is that really good salespeople don't leave companies, they leave managers. Yes, that's true. So if you have a bad manager, you're, you're, in, in, you're vulnerable to losing you know, your top salespeople because they're gonna go and work for a company that has a good manager. So that's, that's a piece of the culture. Go ahead, Gerhard. Well, um, John, I think you, you bring up an, a very interesting point, which is that what is culture? And the culture is really in any company a collection of all the stories that people are telling in the present moment that relate to the history of the company. And some of the stories are aspirational, some of them are inspirational. So I think sales enablement is all about <clears throat> finding the right stories and putting them out there so salespeople can shop for the best stories that give them the best chances of <coughs> connecting with the customer. Can, can I add on to that real quick, to that question? Right. And that is that there's an assumption there's an assumption that all tools help, right? And I think that we tend to inflict things on the sales force sometimes uh, because we think it's good yeah. for them. I think it's, I'd call it, you know, hey, I gotta get my kids to eat their vegetables. Well, then let's be really creative about eating mm -hmm. vegetables, right? But at the end of the day, salespeople 
take the path of least resistance. I'm a, I'm a poster child for that, right? If, if, if I don't see it, it looks too hard, I gotta really think about it, and I'm dubious about the, the benefit to me, I'm not doing it. I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna do it, but I won't do it. And as a leader, I'm actually there to prevent that from happening. Now, what's the good news? The good news is, I think the strategy would be if you can find some early adopters, just like a product introduction, right? If you could find some early adopters that are eager to yeah. do this and you could prove the benefits in, it's just like selling, it's just internally, right? Get the benefits and then present the leaders. Different story, but I think sometimes it's like CRM. I, mean, I don't even want to bring that up for a vote, but CRM, I have not met a salesperson yet that loves their CRM right. system, mm -hmm. right? right? because we tend to in inflict it on people and say, do this, do that, and they're like, what do you want me to do? You want me to do tools? You want me to sell? sell. I bet you've never heard that one before, right? <laughs> so I would just be very careful about that, and if it really is a killer app, killer tool, there's a lot of ways that you can sell it internally. Cool. I have one more thought, which is, <laughs> we need to think more in terms of beyond stories, what's the next? and we need to become more visual storytellers. Mm. I think the ABC doesn't serve us anymore. I think Gutenberg, uh, God rest his soul, he did a wonderful thing in, in printing things. I don't believe in print anymore. That's why we have selling power online <laughs> with videos. And we had the greatest success in educating people with video. And uh, Andrea is a prime example mm. um, with uh, Lightspeed VT training at Selling Power University. Um, people want to see things and not just have the left brain engaged, but also see the person and feel that content and make yeah. it part of their own and give them a choice. Give them a big hand. Thank you very much. Hey, Gary, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.